we therefore <clears throat> only ask one question as anthropologists, and it's it, it's only one question, but it's it's quite a big one. Uh, what does it mean to be human? And uh, in addressing this question, especially here in the Radical Anthropology Group, and we're based at University College London, as as Issy has said, here we we don't chop up humanity into segments. So mostly, if you go to an anthropology department, you'll be asked what you want to do. Do you want to do social anthropology, or maybe biological anthropology, or some other kind of anthropology? And we we don't here at UCL we we kind of do everything. So, so this means that we address what does it mean to be human um, by asking many different questions. One of them is what might it be to be nearly but not quite human. <laughs> so. Um, uh, Chimpanzees are close relatives of ours, and many of my friends have been studying these very, very intelligent relatives of ours. And you can perhaps say that they're not, they're not exactly human. Um, I'm sure a chimpanzee would have a slightly different way of putting it, and regardless, as you know, in some ways, not proper chimpanzees. Um, but that's that primatology is, is and. and Biological anthropology is quite important to work out what it is that makes us different because chimpanzees are uh, They have politics. They have obviously very subtle communication, but you know, but clearly we're a different species and we do things differently Another approach which we also do here at University College London is ask what it might mean to be Homo habilis Homo erectus maybe the Neanderthals and these are humans who lived in the past uh, and again all humans across the planet at the moment we're all very close relatives of each other but genetically almost identical um, but there wasn't so long ago there were many different kinds of humans um, and so it's again interesting to ask what exactly is it which made what we call modern homo sapiens uh, different and then finally there's the, there's the kind of most typical way of doing anthropology and that's to ask about all the different ways there are of being human right across the world um, how many different ways are there of respecting the sacred, of organising sex and kinship, of looking after children? And it's just so important, especially in the West and especially in capitalist countries like, like the one where I live. So often we think that the way we do things is natural. For example, people might think, well, a child is bound to have a mother and a father. Um, well, you know, many Aboriginal people, have, as I'm sure most of you will know, People across Amazonia and other places, they say, "How can a how can a woman manage when you know when she's just all on her own and the children have only got one mother?" Because across the world, nearly everywhere you go, especially if you go to hunter gatherers and horticulturalists before you get big cities, um, the word that the word for mother will mean many different people. So if a child says, "My mummy is not feeling very well," um, the word mother, my mother could mean one of many different mothers. Every child's got lots of different mothers. And of course, that means that if the child is getting having an argument with one mother, I mean, if you take, say, some of the Pueblo um, villages in, in, in the United States, you know, the child's having problems with, with mummy. Well, okay, well, you've got another mummy or another one or another one. You just, you just go to the next house and you've got lots of different mothers. And of course, the, new, the other mother you've, turned, you've chosen to go with won't know what the argument is. And so that's a wonderful freedom for children, as well as, of course, a wonderful source of uh, affection and, and love. So um, one of the things which we ask about what it means to be human is in connection with uh, gender. Again, in the West, we have this view, and it's a kind of scientific view. I mean, it's called science, and it is that it's natural um, for men to dominate women. Why is it natural? Well, because men are a bit stronger. Um, and maybe men don't have childcare responsibilities, and so they can connect up with each other easy, more easily and do and, and organize polit political arrangements. And so it's widely agreed in the West that some element of male dominance, some element of patriarchy is just as much part of being human as having uh, four fingers and a thumb uh, on each hand. Uh, and so it's very interesting to know that that's actually not a, a, a totally universal view. And if you go around most of the world, most of Aboriginal Australia, Papua New Guinea, many parts of Africa, Amazonia, um, the, the, the stories which people tell about what it means to be human 
actually reverse that very idea. And the belief is, and this is among people where they have quite strong monopoly of ritual power by men. The men will say, um, women have an, un have a, an unfair advantage over, over men. Because women have a menstrual cycle and give birth, they can connect up with each other in ways which are very, very powerful. Um, and in order to, for men to rule, um, men have to take special measures to keep women in their place. And so what I want to do to start with is discuss some of these myths. And I want to really stress, wherever you have a male monopoly of ritual power, the men will have um, a centre of their power. And, and very often it's called a men's house. And it's kind of like a church or a temple. It's a wonderfully solid building. And maybe later on I'll show you some one or two pictures of these buildings. And the, in the men's house is the source of the men's power. But the men will say, um, we have this power, but originally it was women's. And we had to steal the power from women. Um, and, and, and in order to keep the power, which is very precarious, um, we have a constant, we need constant vigilance. Because as soon as we let go, as soon as we relax a little bit, what will happen will be the natural ability of women to connect up with each other through the cycles, through the moon, will mean that women will rule again. Um, so perhaps I'll just start by reading some of these, um, one, of, one of these stories to give you the flavor of it. And I, I really want to stress the, these stories are kind of everywhere. You will, you will find almost no place in the world apart from Western capitalism, which don't have some idea, some theory that women originally ruled the world. And so what I want to be doing is, is asking, well, can that be true? Uh, can it have been true that once women rule the world. Once upon a time there was matriarchy and that, that's, that was how humanity began. So this is one of the versions, this is from Tierra del Fuego and it's called The Origin of the Hain. The eight, that's spelled H-A-I-N. Uh, and it goes like this. Um, In the beginning witchcraft was known only by the women of Ona land. They practiced it in a lodge which no man dared approach. The girls, as they neared womanhood, were instructed in the magic arts, learning how to bring sickness and death to those who displeased them. The men lived in abject fear and subjection. Certainly they had bows and arrows with which to hunt, yet the men asked, what use are such weapons against witchcraft? The tyranny of women bore down more and more heavily until at last one day the men resolved to fight back. They decided to kill the women, whereupon there ensued a great massacre from which not one woman escaped in human form. The men spared their little daughters and waited until these had grown old enough to become wives. And so that these women should never be able to band together and regain their old ascendancy, the men inaugurated a secret society of their own and banished forever the women's lodge in which so many wicked plots had been hatched. So this is an example of, a, of a, what we call a myth of primitive matriarchy, a, a myth told by men to explain why men rule the world. And what they say is that we stole these secrets of rule um, from women and we now occupy a big lodge that's like a temple but often made of wood and straw and stuff um, and this, they say originally um, this lodge this house um, was controlled by um, by women um, so uh, let me give you another one um, this is an, um, the, the, called the origin of the Kina again from Tierra del Fuego and the tribe is called the Yamana in the beginning, women had sole power. They gave orders to the men who obeyed, just as women do today. The men took care of the children, tended the fire and cleaned the skins, while the women did no work in the hut at all. That was the way it was always to be. The women invented the great key in the hut and everything which goes on inside it, and then fooled the men into thinking they were spirits. They stepped out of the great hut, painted all over with masks on their heads. The men did not recognize their own wives who, simulating the spirits, beat the earth with dried skin so that the earth shook. The yells, howls and roars so frightened the men that they hastened into the huts and hid, full of fear. But one day the sun man, who supplied the women's spirits in the Kina hut with an abundance of game, overheard the voices of two girls while he was passing a lagoon. Being curious, he hid in the bushes and saw the girls washing off painting, which was characteristic of the spirits when they appeared. They had also been practicing their imitations of the voices of the spirits. Suddenly the sun man confronted them 
insisting that they reveal to him what went on in the Kina hut. Finally, the women confessed. It is we women ourselves who paint ourselves and put on masks. Then we step out of the hut and show ourselves to the men. There are no other spirits in here. It's we women ourselves who yell and howl in this way in order to frighten the men. So the sun man returned to the camp and exposed the fraudulent women. In revenge, the men stormed the Kila hut and a great battle ensued in which the women were either killed or transformed into animals. From that time on, the men have performed in the Kina hut. They do this in the same manner as the women before them. So I, 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 it's, uh, if I was to go through these stories from all over the world, you'd find again and again, although the stories are different, they have the same underlying logic. There's a certain kind of lodge, and in that lodge, women once had the power, and if I was to go through some more of the stories, I, it would become apparent what this power is. This power is something to do with the moon. It's something to do with, with as, as the myths say, women's ability to connect up with each other by synchronizing with the moon. Um, and the, wit and the, the witchcraft, the potency, the, the power of women, which, which men are so terrified of, is the power of women's blood. Menstruation is regarded as a, as, a, as a source of immense power, especially um, if women start to connect up their menstrual cycles with each other uh, by using the moon as the clock through which they do that. And so, to cut a long story short, um, it turns out that this lodge in which men rule is actually a menstrual hut. It's a hut where women go to menstruate, to, to share their female secrets, their women's secrets, maybe to give birth, maybe to get away from their husband and have some solidarity amongst other women. Um, so, I mean, that, that myth, I don't know what everyone here thinks of it. It, it sounds very unlikely, very, str very strange. But what I want to do is to um, convince you that I certainly don't want you to think the myths are true, they're mythology. And they're, they're patriarchal myths. They're designed to frighten men into thinking that if women aren't kept down, often with terror, really, um, what will happen is you'll have the, the, the calamity of women's rule. And in every case, the myths say that when women rule the world, then we had chaos. And in order for culture and moral behavior to be established, you needed the rule of men. So there's no way am I going to be defending the myths. But what's interesting me is where, why do men have those myths and what, what's really going on. Now, what you need to know is that in the men's house, in these societies, what men claim to do is to menstruate. And you might find that astonishing. And it's, it's remarkable how anthropologists kind of know this, um, that men menstruate. And yet it's, I don't know, it's a difficult subject. So just to explain, Right across Aboriginal Australia, men, mostly in, across Australia, not everywhere, but in most parts of Australia, men practice what are something called sub-incision. And that, that's cutting the penis, maybe cutting your arm and bleeding. And the men do this together. And they, f they form a lot of solidarity from this shared experience of bonding through, through bleeding. And they also claim that they're giving birth. And what happens is that the men will every now and again, uh, on a seasonal basis, they will have a, a, a massive ceremony, a, a male initiation ceremony. And during the ceremony, the men will cut themselves and they will say, while they're cutting themselves, and while they're cutting themselves together, they will say, we stole these secrets from women. Um, and they will also say that they're giving birth to the children. So what they, what they will argue is that, um, they will sort of say, well, okay, women give birth to flesh, but proper spirits, boys who, who've got spirit and, and not just flesh, they need to be born a second time. And, and to be born properly, men have to do it themselves. And so the men have um, childbirth as well. And what they say is, they say, while they're doing these operations, they'll say, what we're doing now is we're robbing women of their power. Um, because if the women were to um, synchronize their menstrual cycles, and to, if the women were to gain solidarity and power from childbirth and from their connectedness with each other through childbirth, then again, they say the, the world will be um, in, in a state of chaos. And what I want to do is to um, well, a couple of a couple of things here. 
Um, um, there's a, a very uh, wonderful book which came out a while ago um, by um, an anthropologist called um, Win Maggie, and she um, she worked in a in a, in a part of um, uh, what's now Pakistan, of course, and the the, the, the Kalasha people of northwest Pakistan. And what I want to do now is describe. A, a, a living culture where women really do have the only temple in the in the village. There's a, a big building, and it's um the, it's uh, and it's the um, central building in the in the in the village. And uh, I just want to read out. Um, it, and it's called the Bashali. It's a communal menstrual house. So I, I think most people will know that in many traditional cultures, when women menstruate, they're put into a hut. And we think this hut as being oppressive and isolating, and often, very often is, of course. But here we have an example where this, not a hut, it's a big, um, almost a temple. Uh, and, and it's somewhere where women go to find solidarity with each other. And when I describe it, I think you'll notice there are uncanny parallels with the stories about when women did rule in huts, which are very much um, like this. So this is um, the anthropologist, Win Maggie. I don't want to make the mistake <coughs> of leading you to believe that women always achieve mystic solidarity simply by virtue of sharing time in the menstrual house. Yet one of the delightful things, for me at least, is that for a few days, women whose paths otherwise rarely cross find these things in common. The Bashali is a place of intense physical intimacy where women share knowledge about their bodies that would be unthinkable in everyday life. So women, uh, well, Win Mackey's book is called Our Women Are Free, because this is something which the men in this culture, they say of the women. Women in the Kalasha Valley consider themselves free, whether they're married or not. Uh, men are not just supportive, but proud of the fact that their women are free to travel, free once married to return whenever they like to the home where they were born, back to their mothers, and most importantly, free to resist the demands of men. And so in this community, there are no isolated menstrual huts. Instead, there is a large and well-built sacred building serving as a common meeting house for the women who see it as the physical center for their solidarity, uh, their freedom. Women congregate here when menstruating or giving birth so that any, at any one time, there may be as many as 20 women inside, gossiping, laughing, singing together, many with their babies and toddlers. During their stay in what they call their most holy place, Women compare notes on the duration of their menstrual flows. Um, and the Pashali building is off limits to men and provides a period of refuge and a reprieve extending over several days. And women who want to get away from their husband for a few days can use it as a refuge. And Win Maggie even relates how young women who plan to elope would use the excuse of menstruation as a pretext for leaving her family confident in the support and solidarity she would find. Um, and she describes graphically how women enjoy the intimacy of sleeping in the Bashali, arms and legs wrapped closely together. So in this hut, the women are very intimate with each other and with their children. And, um, and, and it's, it's not a kind of women's refuge because this is the, it's not, it, it is a kind of women's refuge, but it's not as if they live under a patriarchy. This is the, this is the most important building in the society. Um, well, you might think that's simply one example but, um, and it is, and it is an example, and of course, in many parts of Pakistan, this, this kind of thing certainly wouldn't wouldn't happen. But what, what 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 we need to think about, if we're asking, what does it mean to be human? We need to think about this, this, the, the, the aspects of human nature which make us different from other um, primates. So, as scientists, we look at all these different things, and we try to be objective, and we try not to be to sort of nervous about transgressing certain taboos. And of course, I, I find it difficult to talk about menstruation because I'm a man and I'm very well aware in, in so many of the world's religions. Um, it's just a difficult topic, very, very difficult to talk about. But as soon as you think about it, you'll, you'll, I think you'll agree with me, there's something almost true about those, those myths. Um, and what I mean by that is, is this, the human female, of course, I don't have to tell you this, has a, has a menstrual cycle, and the length of the menstrual cycle, on average, we can go into some statistics in a moment, obviously it's variable, I mean, but on average it's 29.5 days. So uh, a, a, a girl in her teenage years will have a slightly longer cycle. Around the time of maximum fertility in life, it will be pretty close to 29.5 days. And then as you 
grow a bit older, um, it begins to speed up before menopause. It begins to come shorter. Well, I'm so often told by scientists, um, Chris, don't worry about it. It's not, a, it's not a, of no interest, 29.5 days. When I say, well, actually, have, have we noticed 29.5 days? That's the time it takes for the moon to pass through its phases as seen from the Earth, 29.5 days. And I'll keep getting told, Chris, don't worry about it. It's just a coincidence. And of course, the scientists that tell me that, you know, they're right, it, it could be just a coincidence. But before we dismiss it as a coincidence, why not look to see whether or not there could be some evolutionary advantage to having a cycle length, pretty much exactly the length of the moon, so that women could, in principle, use the moon as a clock in order to gain solidarity through the shared cycle. Now again, of course, other animals, other primates that we're related to, um, great apes, monkeys, and so on, also have cycles, and we call them menstrual cycles. Uh, and, and quite a lot of them are fairly close to 29.5 days, the, the length of the lunar cycle. But with our great ape closest relatives, um, it's not that close. So for example, with chimpanzees, and we're often told that we're closely related to chimpanzees, and, and we are genetically closely related to chimpanzees. Their cycle is 36 days. Um, bonobos, uh, another, another species of chimpanzees, are, who, who by the way are matriarchal, so <laughs> we're related to a species of chimpanzee where the females regularly form coalitions with each other, there's never been an occasion of rape, females back each other up against the males, if, there's a, if a couple of females come across a male and they want, they want his food, he tries to grab the food, the female bonobos will gang up together um, and, and kind of beat him up. And the, and the males are very, very careful, very you know, aware not to, not to anger a, a, a baby, for example, because they know, they're pretty well aware that the, the baby's mother will be watching and the whole group of females will, is likely to um, take action against that male. So I'm just saying bonobos are closely related, related to us, but they're not patriarchal, they're matriarchal. Now, of course, we're not bonobos, but the point I'm wanting to make is bonobos have a 40-day cycle. So even if bonobos wanted to use their clock, use their cycles to link up with each other using the moon as the clock. It, it'd be very difficult for them because their, their cycle is just too long. It's the, wrong, it's, you know, it's, it's the wrong rhythm. Humans have exactly the length of menstrual cycle you would predict if in the evolutionary past it was adaptive. In other words, it gave advantages to our evolving ancestors, our, our great, great grandmothers to synchronize their cycles using the moon um, as a clock. Um, ovulating at full moon, menstruating at dark moon. That's, so all I'm saying is, you know, it, it could be a coincidence, but why not look, look to see whether or not there would have been, would have been an advantage in, in doing that. Hunter-gatherers um, are, 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 are people that were, are partic can particularly um, in, inform us about what it means to be human before uh, the rise of property, boundaries, warfare, um, hierarchy, uh, and, and all the all the all the things which have plagued us humans for a, a very long time since what we call the Neolithic Revolution, and in Africa, hunter gatherers still live in some parts of Africa, um, Central Africa particularly, in what we can only call superabundance. They live a wonderful life, lots of different types of game animals, wonderful food, many many different kinds of honey, for example, um, and in those societies. Women have an enormous amount of power, and I'm going to have to <laughs> turn my phone off because it's annoying. <laughs> um, and um, just very, very briefly, I, I, I won't use my notes because it would probably take too long. But just take um, there's a, a, a rather marvelous book written many years ago, Colin Turnbull, called The Forest People, and these are the Mbuti um, people of the Ituri Forest uh, in, in Central Africa in the rainforest. And there, there's no um, negative taboos around. Oh, Mark, for goodness sake. Mark, keep ringing. Um, so, what happens is that, <laughs> uh, well, okay, when a, when, a, when a girl begins to menstruate, it's a huge celebration. Um, and in this, this particular instance, which he discusses, there were two girls started to menstruate together. And everyone wanted to celebrate the fact that she had been blessed by the moon, as they put it. And um, 
they went into a what's called an Alima house. That's a, like a grass hut, which is a, a, a large hut where the girls with her sisters and aunts and other female relatives, they would stay for several days singing and dancing and le learning about becoming a girl, about becoming a woman, a young woman, and, and learning all about what boys are and, and all the kind of <laughs> basic things that the girls need to know about. Um, but they're celebrating inside this uh, Alima house. This, and this Alima house, again, as soon as you hear about this Alima house, you realize, okay, this is very like those images of houses in the matriarchy myths, which women were, according to the myths, the women were you know, enjoying their solidarity and their power, and which men were slightly afraid of. So in the Alima house, the girls um, uh, sing, um, bond with each other, and get very intimate, rather like the, the example I was mentioning just, just now about the, 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 the Kalasha people. And, from, and then after a few days, the girls, I mean, what, and by the way, what happens, all the boys in the area, they come around. And they're very excited because there's some girls in the hut which, who, who, who the boys are very interested in. But what happens is that the, the girls um, are not going to be passively waiting for some boy to, um, you know, sort of uh, form a relationship. The girls come out with these saplings and they chase after the boys. Um, and any boy they manage to, to catch but, and by touching with a sapling, he's on a bound to visit the girls in that Elima house. And he's kind of jumped on by a whole bunch of women. And he learns a little bit about sex um, under those circumstances. And you can, I think you can understand how learning about sex in a in a way where the women are very much in, with their solidarity and power is going to kind of produce a different kind of psychology a sexual psychology um from other in other cultures where of course they hold all these ideas about conquest are part of the a part of the culture um and so and and and, and my, my colleague um jerome lewis here at ucl um, will, will tell you very similar things about uh, another group of uh, hunter gatherers from a different part of the um of the rainforest of, the, of central africa where the, where the women have um, very powerful solidarity linked to menstruation. They have a ritual called Ngoku, where the women just, what happens is um, the women will bond together, sing, link arms, and then take over the whole central part of the camp in a very raucous way, kind of making fun of the men, playfully laughing at them, and making, making, you know, it's kind of, it, the, the men could feel a bit insulted because they're, you know, their, their sexual performance might be commented on. The, the women are in a, in a very full of laughter, and the men have to kind of put up with all this, and they do put up. They're, they're very respectful of it all. But, but the point is that what happens now is that the, 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 the women kind of make their point. They, they, they've exercised their rule, if you like, in a playful, laughing way, and then they get a bit fed up with ruling because that can go on for too long. And what the women do is they relax again and they allow the men to have another ritual to establish their, um, their, their um, power. Um, and that's called a jengi. So you have a, 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 like a seesaw. Women rule for a, a few days. Then there's normal life, if you like, for a, for a bit. And then after a while, the men decide, okay, they're going to answer the women's rule with a jengi, which is a version of men's rule. And what um, one of our colleagues in the radical anthropology group, Mona Finnegan, described this as, she called it communism in motion. And she did, a, a, apart from the field work she did with Jerome Lewis, um, she also did a lot of research about other hunter-gatherers across Africa. And she worked out that this pendulum of power was the, was the, was the kind of regular pattern for hunter-gatherers in Africa when they've got abundance, when they're not, when they're not faced with economic scarcity when, there, when there's plenty of large game animals to hunt lots and lots of delicious food lots and lots of time cats kind types of honey what would happen is that you get this pendulum the women rule in a, in a playful way but because it's so much fun to overthrow the men and take power across the whole camp they don't want to just do it once and rule and stay in power they much rather let the men take over because then the women can have the joy of overthrowing the men again. But of course the men have the joy of overthrowing the women and you get this pendulum to and fro, to and fro, which is what Mona calls um, communism in motion. So I, this talk was um, <laughs> um, titled, Did Matriarchy Ever Exist? And I mean, I'll just kind of sum up fairly quickly by giving you what I think is the answer, which is that when women hold the power, they don't hang on to it. They don't 
overstay their welcome if you like women when when women have power they they like to share it and let go and surrender as well as take that power again um, and so matriarchy kind of existed but it wasn't a permanent fixed state women didn't just rule and stay in charge of society they they ruled for a bit had some fun and then let and then and then let the other side take over in in, a, in if you like the battle of the sexes the battle of the sexes and for hunter gatherers is a playful uh, battle between the, the the community of women and the community of, of men but what happens in the course of history <clears throat> and we can argue about and discuss what it was which led to this is that when finally men take over <clears throat> and so it's their rule they increasingly um <clears throat> they increasingly you know um, resent and feel threatened by the even the periodic rule of women and so when men take over and establish patriarchy it becomes a fixed state not a periodic one and it's no longer linked to the periodicity of uh, the moon right before i stop a, a number of other things I've, I've talked about did matriarchy ever exist and i've said i don't think matriarchy as a permanent state was ever the system the, the, the system for humans for our human ancestors but if, if um but what i will argue and it's and there's so much evidence in favor of this nowadays luckily we now have we have very sophisticated genetics and some of the um, science of genetics is called paleogenetics and that means using genetics to work out patterns of kinship and residence um, in the past now i've always thought and i wrote in my book that the original uh, pattern of kinship for our species for all humans was essentially matrilineal in other words your mem your membership of a descent group like a, a lineage would have been passed on down through females and residents would also have been um what we call matrilocal in anthropology matrilocal residence means that a, a young woman when she comes of age and begins to have a sexual relationship she stays with mum she stays with her mother, she stays with her sisters, she stays with her brothers actually who also defend her and the, and the young man if he wants a relationship with her as a hunter he will have to bring meat to her and she's backed up by her mother and other kin. So that's called matrilocal residence, that's the opposite of what happens with farmers where mostly um, a young woman has to be has to move away from her mum and she ends up married in her husband's um, village. And so she's lost her relatives and without her relatives of course she hasn't got very much power whereas the husband of course will have his relatives his father and his uh, and, and all of his kin but matrilocal residence was there's no question about it that was the original i've always thought it was the original system and if as soon as you got matrilocal residence like women staying with mum throughout life even when married the, the system of, of descent uh, is going to be tipping down tipping towards matrimony and what i'm saying is We've now got the proof of that because across Africa, the geneticists have found out and all they need to do is just take somebody's hair and give it a, a DNA analysis. And they found out that women have been living with mom, living with mom, living with mom, living with mom. We don't quite know how long, but it certainly seems as if down, down through the ages. And we, we now think probably um, right since we evolved. I mean, and perhaps another thing just as an aside to say is that all of us who look in, who think that it's very important if you want to understand things we need to look at their historical origins what seems to be true now is that we humans became fully human with language and culture and kinship and religion in africa quite a long time ago about three hundred thousand years ago and and so the, the first um, fully cultural fully linguistic humans were africans no doubt about that before we spread out around the, the rest of the world and, and, and essentially it would have been women's activity, women's solidarity and women's activity, which produced the, the, the most important features of, of culture. Getting rid of violence, getting rid of rape or the threat of rape, establishing rules, that, and uh, cultural rules. And of course, as soon as you think about it, if you think about, okay, a rule governed society, what is, what's the most essential thing to have in any society when it, when it comes to rules? And the, the, rule, the rules about sex, are actually at the heart of the, all the world's religions in different ways of course um, and if you if there aren't rules about that if, if women can be um, abused uh, raped 
um, I mean, forget any other kinds of rules. If there's not a rule against rape, which of course women would need, with their brothers, of course, to be able to uh, assert and, and establish. But anyway, as soon as you've got matter local residents, what you have is, an, is, and this now begins to move into the uh, domain of not exactly architecture, I suppose, but certainly organization of space. Across Africa, wherever you've got matrilineal um, descent, what happens is that a man, and, uh, and it, even more when it's matrilocal residence, a man will have always have two homes. He will, he will have the place where he's got his rights, his kinship rights, and that will be with his sister, um, and, her, and, uh, and he, so he will, he will, his, his own children will be his sister's children. Every, anyone who knows anything about Africa will, will, will immediately recognize this. The guardian of a child, the most important guardian, will be the mother's brother. Um, and so the, the, a man will have his, his home with his sister, where he, he's the guardian of the, his sister's children. Um, and that's, that's his matrilineal home, if you like. But he will also, of course, visit um, his bride. Um, but he won't have rights there. He'll, he'll have obligations there. He'll need to surrender his kills that he makes in the hunt or the other, other produce which he produces. And, and he can't accumulate property because his in-laws, when he visits them, will insist on taking everything he produces to share out among themselves. And if he wants rights in property, rights in, in anything at all, re religious property or food or anything else, he better go back to his sister. Um, so so that, what can you see what that, that does? That means that every man has got kind of cross-cutting ties Nobody's got all their obligations and responsibilities in one household. Men are constantly crisscrossing, crisscrossing, crisscrossing across the landscape. And what that does is it knits together the landscape. Um, it, it connects everyone together. Um, and just to end on, end, and I, I, I'll see if, if, if Isias can help, can sort of <laughs> help me get some, a couple of pictures up, up and running. Uh, where, where, do you get, where do you get these matrilineal um, kinship networks, you have a, um, a kind of um, transpatial bonding where kind of you're, you're, you're always at home, but your home is, it's not like an Englishman's home is his castle. It's not like your, your, your home has got a little fence around it. Your home is wherever you have kin and you have kin all over the place. Um, and perhaps the most impressive example of that is, is the continent of Australia, Aboriginal Australia where if you went on walkabout, you could go 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles, and you, you'd end up a different, at a different part of the continent. And um, you have to be respectful, and you, you meet the, elder, the elders in this new territory. Um, you've never been there before, you don't speak the language, but they will ask you, what, what is your totem? Which means, what is your flesh? And you might say, okay, emu. And they say, ah, oh, emu, right, okay, these are your wives, those over there, they're your mothers-in-law, these are your brothers, these, <laughs> these are your children. So wherever you go across the landscape, you, you slot into the kinship network. You, 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 you're, you're kind of at home wherever you are and, you're, and your kinship relationships are like portable. It's almost as as you go traveling, you, you carry your kinship, net, your kinship relationships with you and you can slot into the, into the system wherever you, wherever you are, despite the fact that the languages and so many other things are, are different. Now, a lot of people who haven't particularly maybe studied um, Aboriginal Australian kinship will probably have heard of the term song lines. And the song lines are these paths crisscrossing the whole continent of Australia. And what you do is you sing songs. And you sing the songs of the ancestral beings. And you, you and so when you have a song, which is the way a myth is told, it's told in, in song, a long, long story. And the story, the story will, will be about the travels of the ancestral beings. And usually in many parts of Australia, these ancestral beings are sisters, often very, very often two sisters. So the sisters, the Dreamtime sisters, they would have traversed the landscape, um, giving the landscape its names, establishing the rules, of, of, of the, the totemic rules, the, 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 you know, if you like, the religious rules of the, of the culture. Um, and in the stories, what's so interesting is that the, the, the ancestral beings, they, they move, they stop, they move, they stop. And in the case of the two Wawanak sisters, which are the, 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 the myth of the two Wawanak sisters is probably the most well-known myth of all Aboriginal Australia. The two sisters um, form a snake. And they form a, uh, which, which, okay, they, they form a snake by connecting up with each other. So what the sisters do is they, when, they're, when, they, when they stop at a water hole and give birth, these, these are mythical creatures, of course, and menstruate. 
their, their blood flows connect up with each other. And as the blood flows connect up with each other, these are the, the sort of threads, the, 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 the red threads of blood, which connect up to different aspects of the landscape. And I mentioned a snake, because of course, if you wanted to think of a creature, which is like a thread, like a long line, um, a kangaroo won't really cut it, but a snake is a good image, a good metaphor. So one of the stories simply says that the two sisters arrived at a waterhole, they sat down, they opened their legs, they faced each other, they both menstruated and they created a loop out of their blood. And they, they looped this, um, this um, rope, if you like, this red thread around themselves and got themselves swallowed. And this is the this is the, the probably the most one of the most famous motifs in in mythology, the, the myth of the rainbow snake. The rainbow snake is the ritual power of the synchronized menstrual flow. And um, even if you don't know very much about um, Aboriginal Australian mythology, we all know that that snake. It's a very familiar motif in world mythology, and we we often call it the dragon. So the and so what this is, it's a cyclical thing. It's, it's the full moon and the dark moon, it's ovulation and menstruation, it's women coming together with each other and then separating to have relationships with men, but, but you come together and you separate, you come together, you separate. And in mythology, that's the difference between being with your kin and away from your kin is, is this, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's conceptualized as the, as the same thing as the difference between earth and sky. So you're moving between earth and sky, kinship and marriage, uh, water and fire, male and female, and, and, and of course the dragon, when you think about, just imagine a dragon, it's, um, it's the highest creature because it's got wings, it's the lowest creature because it's a snake without any legs, it lives in the water, it breathes fire, it's always connected with the tides and or the moon, and it's women's solidarity which produces the snake, even though the snake itself is often, in fact always, gender ambivalent, it's not just female, or, and it's not just male, it's, it's like a, if it's a male, it's a male with breasts, so it's this really potent uh, unity of opposites, um, which, is the, which is central to all the world's mythology. Um, so uh, there must be some reason for all this, and um, just, just, just to end, I don't know quite what the lesson of all this, <laughs> all the lesson, the lesson of this is, but um, under patriarchy, increasingly, uh, we have been isolated in our homes. Patriarchy has consistently and relentlessly, especially isolated women from each other um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the domestic space, but, in, but also, of course, increasingly in terms of, of, of childbirth and childcare. So if you look at a, a place like where I live in London, you've got all these tower blocks maybe, um, and they're, they're designed to isolate. The, the whole point is to make sure that community doesn't happen. In, in, a, in a London tower block in, built since the 60s or 70s, you can go out of your, your, your front door and, and you're in the lift and going downstairs. And even if you meet your neighbour in the bus stop, you don't even know it is your neighbour. You're actually it's almost designed to prevent neighbours from getting to know each other. And um, of course, a, a, a woman will have a, her children to look after and she's alone. She hasn't got a mum. She hasn't got a sister. She hasn't got lots of different. The, the children haven't got lots of different mothers. They've just got one mother. And the architecture is designed to cement that isolation of women from each other and make being a woman, especially a woman in terms of your, you know, your, your body and your cycle and your your, your childcare, um, not a not an empowering experience. It doesn't something which connects you up. You can make an effort to connect up. Of course, you can go to the school. You can go to the you know. The mothers and toddlers club you can meet with other women but but, the, but it's kind of if you manage to do that it's kind of despite the system um and not because of the system and one of the things which i mean i, I got me interested in all this a while ago um, was um a description of um of, of even london and liverpool and other working class areas right up until the 40s or 50s where um actually the housing uh, which of course was not very good quality housing and it was condemned as, as slum dwellings and mostly most of them were demolished in her house window and you're in direct contact with the street there's not these front gardens not these porches not the sort of lace curtains you're in direct contact with other people walking up and down the street you can go out and use slippers to the local shop Probably in East London, mostly women would live would be living very close to their mother, anyway, 
Um, the, the men would have, of course, the pub um, to, to, to congregate in, um, and increasingly those are, <laughs> those are disappearing. And, and perhaps just to end, I'm sort of hoping I mean, it's strange it's happening, as I, I don't have to tell you, I mean, we'll, we'll be very well aware that something very strange is happening with the COVID. What's happening is all these huge tower blocks are all becoming completely and utterly useless. Um, they're, they're building, mass, still building these massive um, tower blocks in the Canary Wharf area in the city of London. Um, and um, they, they're uninhabitable because in order to get your, your, your workforce into the office for the day, You'd have to pack everyone in the lifts and now that the lifts can only hold four people at most um you take about a week getting everyone in and so of course the fact that people have decided to work at home is becoming increasingly um the norm um just simply to keep safe and what's happening of course is that increasingly as a result of this people have the whole center of gravity is going back again swinging back from the city centers into the places where people live and there are obviously lots of problems with that but you can, I think, see there are also some hopeful prospects there as well, because if people are now active and productive and working in roughly in the places where they live, that will mean a, a huge, uh, I would have thought, sort of swing in terms of power and relevance to actual neighbourhoods. Um, and what the next thing, of course, needs to happen is to have some street parties. Um, and, um, and, and again, we can learn from hunter-gatherers about that. I mean, to have a party at full moon, a different kind of party at full moon, uh, a different kind of, kind of party at dark moon. I, uh, SES mentioned reclaimless streets. This is what we were doing in the, in the early 90s. We were saying the streets need to be reclaimed. They're not for cars, they're for people. Um, reclaim the streets, get some samba, get some music, get some dancing, get some singing in the streets. And as soon as you've had your street party, um, it means that even when, you have, when you're not having a party, um, you, you still form relationships which can continue into the rest of the in the, in the rest of the month, assuming you're able to have a, a street party quite frequently, maybe maybe once a month. Um, so there are lots of things we can learn, I think, from other cultures. I mean, that goes without saying. Um, and just just I suppose the last thing to say is that we became human not purely through Darwinian gradual evolution. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist. I think everyone who's a scientist these days has to agree that Darwinism is the way that our amazing, beautiful planet works. I mean, we, we evolved through what's called natural selection. Um, and so, and we're, we're one of those many creatures. So. But Darwinism, as usually imagined, doesn't have leaps, doesn't have revolutions. And what's absolutely clear um, to me, and, and I'm not the only one who says this, is that we became human not purely gradually and not purely incrementally. In Africa, our ancestors, led by women, managed to win um, a revolution. Um, this, was, this turned the world upside down. It, repl it replaced a kind of primate style, ape style kind of living with a completely different way of, of life based on singing and dancing and uh, a, a kind of bottom up morality. And, and after that, and so, so many people these days, they still say, well, they say to me and others, they say, oh, Chris, well, you can have your revolution, uh, fine. But one thing it won't change, human nature. No revolution could change human nature. There will always be poverty. There will always be inequality. There will always be male dominance. There will always be war um, because that's the way things are. That's human nature. Well, everything distinctively human about our nature, the fact that we've got language, the fact that we can share our dreams, even our eyes, by the way, the fact that we, we have very unusual eyes for great apes. We have eyes for looking in as well as for looking out. We have eyes which give away what we might be looking at and therefore what we might be thinking about. If you look at a gorilla's eyes, they're just sort of dark on dark. It's like a, it's kind of a mobster wearing sunglasses. It doesn't want you to know what it's thinking because the gorillas and, and chimpanzees, they live in a very competitive um, social framework, completely different from those the frameworks established by hunter-gatherers. So the fact that we have these distinctively human features and above all the fact that we can share our dreams and, and attempt to implement them we can think of the future and, and try to work out a, a plan to make sure that our dreams can be acted out in real life all these special things about being human are actually the products of the big of the greatest revolution there ever was um, the human revolution which happened in africa about three hundred thousand years ago the evidence is all over the place particularly in the, in the, the kind of art we can detect produced by red ochre 
but we won this revolution once. And so that's always been a great hope to me, because if we've done it, if we've managed to turn the world upside down once, if revolution is, if you like, part of our history, even part of our nature, um, maybe we can do it again.